Welcome to HIH227, HIL227, Medieval Britain, uh, week four, lecture two on urbanization and urban society. We take it for granted now that uh, uh, for most everyone living in Britain, there is a, a town or a village with shops within easy reach, but that was not always the case. When it comes to urban development, Britain, in fact, lagged way behind most of uh, Northwest Europe. Uh, indeed, was Britain a medieval economic superpower? Uh, no, not at all. That's very much a result of the Industrial Revolution uh, of the 18th and 19th centuries. Trades, trade builds cities, and there are two major urban hubs in Europe. Uh, the first is in the Italian peninsula, particularly large city-states uh, like Venice, uh, Genoa, Florence, uh, Milan, and so forth. And they concentrate uh, mostly on being middlemen who move in exotic goods uh, from the Near East and beyond, such as silks and spices, and uh, ship them out to points across uh, medieval Europe. The other great uh, urban center of medieval Europe uh, comprises the Low Countries and this uh, axis from Westphalia uh, through to Lubeck uh, in the Holy Roman Empire. Keep in mind that the Holy Roman Empire is the medieval name for what we now know as Germany. Now, in this second area of urban development, we see great, the great cities of Bruges, Ghent, Hamburg, Bremen, Lübeck, uh, and a bunch of others uh, rise uh, really uh, from uh, nothing in the Dark Ages to become really substantial urban centers by the 11 or 1200s. In the Low Countries, uh, urbanization is founded on a, a real simple system of bringing in wool from uh, Britain and other places and turning it into cloth and uh, sending it back out again. It's been described by uh, John Munro and others as Europe's per first industrialized zone. Uh, the Westphalia to Lübeck access, uh, well this is an area where urban development focuses on the movement of goods from east to west, uh, that being timber, uh, pitch, wax, amber, resins, and fur from the Baltic zone, as well as salt fish, and also of moving goods west to east, namely wine and cloth uh, from France and Low Countries. Now, there are flows of goods moving around Europe, particularly Northern Europe at this time. Uh, and I'll get back around to the emergence of Britain's cities in just a bit, but for now it's suffice to say, sufficient to say that uh, we have uh, sort of what we call three main types of survival goods. We have kind of uh, human survival goods uh, flowing about. That's food, uh, which is largely self-supplied, but uh, a lot of people have to top up what they can grow. A clothing overwhelmingly made of wool, uh, that's something else every human needs. You need food and clothing uh, to avoid uh, hunger and cold. And uh, good cloth is largely made in the low countries and distributed via the Hansa. And this word Hansa in the Middle Ages refers to the Hanseatic League, a uh, association of German merchant cities based in Lübeck. Uh, second, there are what we would call Christian survival goods. Uh, fish, which is to be eaten on Fridays uh, as a form of religious observance. Uh, a lot of Catholics even today still have fish on Fridays. Uh, this is uh, largely salt fish from the North Sea, uh, shipped via uh, the Hansa to points uh, across Western and even as far as Southern Europe. The other Christian world survival good is wine, which is required uh, to represent the, the blood of Christ at Mass uh, in every church and monastery in Christian Europe. <clears throat> and of course, you can't grow wine in northern reaches of Europe, uh, in including in Britain in the Middle Ages, uh, and so you have to ship it in. And so there's a huge trade in uh, moving wine about. Uh, this passes uh, to the east in Scandinavian Europe uh, through the Hansa, uh, which buys it up, of course, in France and Spain in the West. The third type of survival goods we might uh, call uh, a noble survival goods. In order to maintain your place in society, if you're in the rich kind of ruling elite, then you need to be able to demonstrate a conspicuous uh, 
uh, display of wealth uh, and the conspicuous consumption of luxury goods uh, to maintain your sort of social standing. These are those items imported largely from Italy, distributed by Italian merchants, and Italian merchants actually set up outposts, as indeed do the German Hansa merchants, uh, in most cities uh, in northwest Europe. For example, uh, Southampton is the big uh, sort of Italian uh, landing point of goods in medieval England, where they're taken uh, overland from Southampton to London and distributed further from there. Uh, in fact, uh, there are so many Italians landing uh, with luxury goods in Southampton in the Middle Ages that in the 1400s, there's actually a big Italian expatriate community and several Italian mayors in Southampton. Uh, these luxury goods are distributed to Scandinavia and Eastern Europe uh, via the Hansa, who buy them uh, from Italian merchants. The Hansa have various warehousing stations, uh, one in London, for example, and they pick up goods coming from Italians and other sources and ship them on uh, to Scandinavian areas uh, in the Baltic uh, zone, which also gets goods to Poland uh, and even as far as the Republic of Novgorod in Russia. Where do the British Isles fit in this? Well, that's a good question because the British Isles are effectively peripheral to the main flows of goods in medieval Europe. Uh, and indeed, Britain is peripheral to the European economy. Britain is a source of raw materials, especially wool. Uh, the largest towns in Britain are ports. Uh, for example, uh, the export of agricultural surpluses such as wool uh, to places uh, where they're turned into manufactured goods, namely the Low Countries, uh, explains the size of ports uh, uh, on the east coast of Britain, for example, uh, York, uh, where wool from the north is gathered up and shipped out. Uh, indeed, a lot of uh, wool and other goods travel out through London. Uh, the big cities and ports of, of uh, uh, medieval Britain, as they, as it were, tend to be on the east coast uh, of the British Isles, where they can, be, where the ships can be effectively pointed off in the direction of the continent. Uh, other important uh, goods moving in and out of Britain, of course, uh, finished goods such as cloth are imported, Christian necessities, salt fish and wine are imported through London and other places, uh, and luxury goods are imported. The largest city in medieval uh, Britain is London uh, by a very long stretch, uh, because as the capital, there is the largest uh, sort of noble resident population and the highest demand for luxury goods. Also, it's favorably positioned uh, on the Thames estuary on the east of Britain, uh, which is to say on the right, on the appropriate side of Britain to get goods off to the continent. Uh, after London, uh, Bristol, uh, York, and in the later latter part of the Middle Ages, Norwich are the largest cities uh, in medieval Britain. Uh, but they're of a size that doesn't begin to compare with the large cities and continent. London has a maximum population of between 60 and 100,000. Uh, and that makes it truly exceptional in Britain because the next largest uh, city is, is maybe half that size at most, around about 1,300, uh, that being York, uh, typically estimated for York. Wales on the west coast is poorly uh, suited uh, for trade and, and poor Ireland out at the end of a long line of communication really only has one natural trading partner, uh, which is uh, England uh, via uh, uh, via Bristol mainly, and, and that's because uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, shipping in the Middle Ages tends to rely on as much as possible keeping in sight of the coast. And when you're coming from Ireland, uh, Britain, of course, is the nearest coastal point, and so uh, goods tend to move first uh, to Britain. Uh, it's a risky business sea travel in the Middle Ages. So what's it mean for Britain being in the raw materials producing periphery? Well, Britain for the whole of the Middle Ages only really had, as I say, one city by European standard. Uh, London saw post-Roman decline and emerged as a royal possession after 1066, gaining a first charter in 1075 from uh, William I, another in 1132 from Henry I, 
Uh, and the one in 1132 uh, gave the city of London county status, which is to say that it had its own sheriff and judicial apparatus. London, as I say, perhaps reaches 80,000 uh, before the plague of 1348-49. York, Norwich, and Bristol had populations pushing 100,000 at most. Uh, it's thought maybe after the Black Death, uh, London's pegged back to maybe 60,000 and Norwich uh, uh, peaks in population, some have estimated at as much as 30,000, uh, meaning at its nearest point, uh, the relationship between London and the second city was uh, London being twice as big as the second city. But for most of the period, London is uh, five or six times bigger than any other city uh, in the British Isles. English towns were overwhelmingly points of exchange for the selling of agricultural surpluses, that is to say grain and wool, and the, agri and the acquisition by peasants of basic durables, uh, that is to say shoes, metal goods, pottery, and other things you can't make yourself. Uh, and because these kind of nodes of exchange don't need to be that big, uh, they tend to be quite small affairs, uh, and it's really only the, the major outport of London and also uh, York, Norwich, and Bristol uh, that see any substantial urban growth on a continental scale. The English pattern of port urbanization is mirrored in other raw materials producing uh, kingdoms such as uh, uh, Poland, which exports salt and amber, or Norway, which exports uh, fish of various kinds. So should we despair of Britain's unurbanized uh, backwardness in the Middle Ages? Well, the very famous historian at the University of uh, Birmingham, the new Marxist historian Rodney Hilton, started in the 1960s into the 1970s saying, actually, we shouldn't despair because while Britain may not have large cities like the continent, it actually has a really developed network of small trading communities, these kind of points of exchange where you sell your wool or grain uh, for a few things made out of metal or uh, metal or clay. Around about 1300, England has six to 700 towns, uh, Ireland uh, 150 to 200, and Wales about 100. Uh, these totals are hotly debated uh, because, of course, there's a question of what makes a town, particularly when you when you're only talking about a few hundred people. We'll come back to that. But this uh, urban network is both uh, dense. These towns tend to only be a day's travel or so from one another. And they're uh, created in a big rush, effectively, between 1100 and 1300. Uh, they're this really sort of dense web of uh, points of exchange for selling surpluses and, get, and buying durables. Uh, some key points here. If you were on the continent, uh, whilst a city like Bruges is very large, there tends to be a very an equally large uh, hinterland around it without small towns. Uh, in Britain, because you don't have large single towns, uh, that kind of clears the way for this dense network of small towns. And so there's a question here of is Britain really backwards so much as just different? So what makes a town as opposed to a village? Well, Rodney Hilton pushes this idea of low-level urbanization. We shouldn't be looking for large buildings and, and complex social organizations. All we need is a community where the majority of persons make the majority of their income from non-agricultural activities. That is to say, for 55% for of people, 55% of their money comes from trade or making small things uh, as a carpenter or blacksmith might. Typical small town occupations include leather workers, you know, tanners, shoemakers, glovers, uh, weavers and fullers, brewers and bakers, carpenters, uh, smiths, uh, serv uh, service persons such as carters, sick nurses, or even prostitutes, even in small towns. Now this, this low level urbanization uh, can comprise communities of, of just a few hundred persons. But they're quite distinct from maybe the next village just down the road where everyone almost universally just farms fields and raises a few pigs. These small towns go through a kind of process of acquiring urban privileges. Now, be aware that um, many towns exhibit urban 
quote-unquote urban characteristics before actually receiving formal recognition with a uh, charter or a document from the king or lord. Uh, but from 1100 to 1300, urban privileges are routinely granted to villages, sometimes to consolidate and sometimes to promote uh, uh, new uh, urban development. So this is a kind of three-step process. So say a king or landlord grants a borough charter uh, or list of trading rights uh, to townsmen. This will typically guarantee people living in a, uh, a settlement, uh, low fixed taxes, uh, uh, it, the uh, right to bring in raw materials and send out finished products without paying tolls on them, uh, the right to not pay tolls in other surrounding towns either, uh, and so forth. In this first stage, the king remains uh, in really tight control uh, over the town. The king, uh, or if not a king, a local lord, will, will uh, appoint the mayor, might even appoint uh, what we now think of as councilmen. Uh, the most common uh, basis of this list of privileges given to the communities is, are the so-called laws of Bertil in Normandy. This is a small town, uh, uh, this, a small town in possession, I think it was of William Fitz Osborne, uh, who becomes Lord of Hereford uh, back in the 1060s and decides to extend to Hereford uh, this particular set of, of rights privileging uh, Hereford over su surrounding agricultural communities. Now that so-called right of Bertil or law of Hereford then gets uh, copied and used again and again for the founding of more towns. Now the second step after a town has its list of little privileges and is off the ground is that the town develops a kind of government. They begin to elect aldermen or councilmen as we would call them now uh, and a mayor. As I say in the beginning uh, the mayor is appointed uh, by the king or the local lord, but increasingly towns petition for the right to appoint their own uh, mayor. Step three is for the townsmen to acquire the so-called farm of the town. This means that they agree to pay a fixed annual fee to the king or lord in exchange for the right to totally self-regulate themselves, to hold their own town court, uh, and to set their own sort of a council tax or rents within the town. What motivates uh, lords and peasants alike to engage in this process of urbanization? Well, a lord might, for example, receive uh, 20 shillings in rents uh, from some fields, and uh, 20 shillings in rents would be a very generous, an incredibly generous, actually, revenue uh, uh, from some fields. But if you convert those same fields into a town where the land is subdivided into tiny little parcels, each occupied by a townsman and his family, then that same amount of space, uh, together with uh, uh, taxes collected in its market and so forth, might generate £12 a year. That is to say, in old money, uh, you know, uh, 12 times as much as you'd get from just collecting rents on the fields. Is 20 shillings in a pound in old money, of course. Now, having a town with its market then allows the Lord uh, to engage in this, this notion of commutation, which is to say to convert uh, the old labor and food rents that uh, peasants had paid into cash. It's not that helpful in the 1200s for a, a Lord with a uh, a chunk of land to collect rents and grain and chickens when he really what he really wants is to go buy some fancy Italian armor in London. What do you do with all that grain and chickens? You know, you, you have to organize getting it to a merchant uh, so that you can turn it into cash. But if you have a market in a small town on your own estate, then your peasants can individually go to the market, sell their grain for pennies, and then give you those pennies in tax. And suddenly it makes it much easier for you to spend uh, the money you're getting in tax revenue. And of course, as labor becomes uh, plentiful, as population trebles between 1066 and 1300, uh, lords want uh, to collect rents in cash so that they can use the cash to uh, pay uh, low cost manual laborers to, to farm their fields and thereby uh, get the work done more efficiently. <clears throat> 
uh, these small towns also provide a venue for the so-called uh, mendicant religious foundations. The, the Franciscans and Dominicans in particular in the late Middle Ages are, are exciting new religious orders that want to go about uh, bringing God to the people by preaching uh, in population centers, you know, to reach as many people as possible out in the streets. And towns are ideal for that. Uh, and so uh, once you set up a monastery in a town which collects most of its income from estates it owns off in far-flung places, but spends most of its money uh, on arc on uh, masonry, uh, building projects, and so forth in the town, that spurs further town growth. In Wales and Ireland, towns uh, could be called on for military service very often because of the colonial nature of urbanization there. A town full of English immigrants in Wales could, as a term of their charter, be required to put together a militia and then go fight on behalf of the Lord. And so if you're a, a Englishman who's just conquered a bit of Wales, founding a town there also helps create a militia to support your government. Later, uh, port towns in particular become a, a, a key revenue raising tool of the English crown. Realizing that uh, the export of raw materials, especially wool, uh, underpins the English economy, later medieval kings such as Edward I uh, raise money by taking large loans from Italian bankers in exchange for uh, giving the bankers the right to collect taxes on wool and other raw materials being shipped out of British ports. Merchants were uh, to submit export uh, materials uh, for inspection and taxation at designated ports called staples from uh, the staple systems reformed in particular in 1353. And in England, uh, these key places you had to ship your goods out of or submit them to inspection at were Newcastle, York, Lincoln, Norwich, Westminster, Canterbury, Chichester, Winchester, Exeter, and Bristol. Uh, in Ireland, they were uh, Dublin, uh, Waterford, Cork, and uh, Drogheda, and in Wales, just Camarthen. But, but the royal requirement that trade be forced through certain towns actually helped those particular towns develop yet further. What are the bottom-up uh, reasons for peasants to want to be involved in uh, uh, the establishment of a new town? Well, uh, they're good opportunities to make money. Uh, if you're a peasant toiling away out in the fields, uh, you can see the concentration of wealth caused by trade uh, that exists in the towns of uh, in the towns of England and in the hands of merchants. Non-inheriting men and women, in particular, who aren't in line to uh, get the family farm, they need somewhere to work, and towns uh, consistently uh, draw in uh, landless people from the countryside, and especially women. Uh, because men uh, will stay in the countryside and toil away on their, their scrap of land uh, if they have something at all to inherit. But, but women who aren't able to inherit if they have brothers even uh, tend to decant off to towns uh, and do work there. Uh, this means on the one hand, uh, there's a lot of begging in towns. Towns tend to be a, a, a focus of immigration, especially in times of famine when there's no food in the countryside and people think, they might be able to get uh, some help in a town. Uh, towns also become a kind of focus of certain minor criminal activities. Uh, I mean, prostitution, of obviously, even in small towns as a result of the disproportionate number of, of women migrating into towns. Towns are also seen as a way to escape from this dreaded bond or unfree status. Uh, the laws of Bertil or law of Hereford as extended to uh, many, many new towns in late medieval Britain contained a clause saying that if you live there for a year and a day, it broke all pre-existing bonds and you were a free person henceforth. Towns can also be a way in which to, to escape from discrimination. Uh, in Wales or Ireland, the, the status of being a burgess, that is to say an owner of town property, uh, gave you equal rights with all other owners of town property. So, you know, if you're a Burgess, you're Burgess. It doesn't matter if you're ethnically Welsh, Irish, or English. Uh, and this could be an escape from the, uh, the uh, harsh taxes that are imposed on racial or ethnic uh, grounds on Welsh and Irish persons. Uh, in Wales, for example, uh, 
uh, Welsh communities often have to pay higher taxes than their English neighbours. And uh, similarly, Welsh persons have partible inheritance in the countryside <coughs> where your estate is divided up between heirs, which is seen when you're trying to create a, a sort of lasting family fortune, it's seen as detrimental to the accumulation of wealth. But if you sell everything and, and become a townsman, then you can pass everything off uh, as a townsman to whomever you want, and you'll designate one heir to get it all. Unfair to second and third sons, perhaps, uh, but key in uh, growing generational wealth. The structure of governance in most of these small towns is very similar. Uh, there's a leader who's either a mayor or uh, sometimes the constable of the castle. Towns in Wales and Ireland, especially in Wales, uh, tend to have a castle embedded in them for defence. And the keeper of the castle, the so-called constable, will often be the de facto mayor. Uh, in farmed towns, of course, where the townsmen go together and buy the right of self-governance, uh, they will appoint their own mayor. Most towns are bailiffs. Uh, these are persons who collect the rents and tolls uh, in the town. And they'll have older men or jurors. This is what we might think of as a town council today. Uh, from the 13, around about 1300, most towns adopt a system of appointing a dozen quote-unquote jurors uh, for six-month terms. And then when the court meets every six months, they report known offenses in the town uh, and people can be put on trial for that or just fine. Uh, these are, there are also minor officials such as ale tasters. Uh, people in the Middle Ages believed that drinking water was bad for your health, uh, which it was uh, if you have very poor sanitation. And so they felt that weak ale with a little bit of alcohol to kill off the germs. So they didn't understand it like that. What they did understand was that, was that ale didn't make you sick. And so, uh, there are brewers, even small towns and officials who check the quality of the ale. There are also so-called leave lookers who are effectively uh, something close to kind of beat cops who, who kind of are meant to sort of wander the town and look for infractions against town regulations. Think traffic warden, maybe. There's a long-term slide towards oligarchic rule. If you find a new town where anybody who turns up gets exactly one one plot of land and pays exactly the same rent, then in the first generation or two you have reasonable equality. But over hundreds of years, property accumulates into the hands of the few most successful families and then they come to dominate local politics. What's town life like? Well, all medieval towns are dependent on migration to sustain population levels. In towns, we have very high mortality. Perhaps a third of infants die uh, due to the kind of uh, un the sanitary, excuse me, the unsanitary close quarters living of urban environments. Uh, as I mentioned, weak ale is considered the, the prime, uh, most important drink uh, due to bad water and contamination. Uh, in fact, they even recommended uh, weaning babies off of breast milk and onto weak ale at the earliest opportunity because it was seen as the, the most healthful drink. In terms of housing, land uh, typically uh, is divided into planned little plots, so-called so burgage plots, on, on which burgesses built their houses. Uh, they tend to be long and thin, maybe 20 feet wide by 100 feet long. Uh, they tend to, the home built on a burgage plot typically has just a couple of rooms, a stall at ground level uh, with some workspace behind it, and a uh, first floor sleeping loft. In the back of that long narrow garden you'll tend to have a midden heap where people uh, throw away their trash uh, uh, and indeed uh, bury their, uh, uh, well, bury their waste, human and otherwise. And they'll typically have some livestock in the garden. Town, small towns in the Middle Ages, indeed right into the 17 or 1800s, tended to have animals living in the gardens in the town. Often a hedge or ditch is what separated one plot from the next, and houses tend to be made out of wood, uh, often uh, pretty superficial structures that have to be rebuilt uh, you know, every generation or so. Uh, 
If we think about the interface between town and country, a town's normally had common fields for burgesses. So uh, when a town's created, the Lord will typically say, if you live in this area, the so-called town, uh, you know, you get a burgage plot, low fixed rents, and freedom from tolls, but you also get access to those fields over there in which you're welcome to keep some cows or sheep. Uh, many burgesses also top that up by buying some farmland outside of town uh, to generate a little more revenue. Before 1350, uh, some minor investment in towns is made by rural landholders, but I think your average uh, peasant is a little bit hesitant to, to get stuck into town <coughs> life if they're doing okay in the countryside. After 1350, there's a big shift and rural landholders increasingly invest in burgages in towns uh, to enter into governance. What they want to do is, uh, uh, as they become more wealthy, they want to have a, a, a place, a stage, as has been suggested, on which they can come and demonstrate to others their superior, uh, their superior wealth uh, and success. And here we, we get almost the kind of image of the, the small town you have in some of Thomas Hardy's much later novels like The Mayor of Casterbridge, where the small town is a place where people gather at the weekend to go for a walk and wear their best clothes and so forth. Uh, if you're wealthy and in the countryside, you'll want a small house in the town to stay in effectively at the weekend. Crime uh, is common, petty crime, uh, interpersonal violence, slander, and the, the so-called raising of hue and cry uh, are very common. Uh, to raise hue and cry is when you feel you've been wronged or attacked, and so you, you literally shout out to draw the attention of others as witnesses. <laughs> That's sometimes done lawfully, but it's as often as not unlawfully done when there's been no real crime, and so the person who raises hue and cry could be fined uh, if they do it wrongly. Uh, in terms of business, most transactions are conducted on a delayed payment basis. So you take it today when you sow your harvest in a couple of months, then you can uh, bring me some money. <laughs> Mortgaging of property uh, is around by about 1250 in the sense that we more or less the sense we have a mortgage today. It grows in importance as time goes on. Case of assault uh, committed by creditors against debtors is very common. Uh, you might think today of banks, depending on how you view banks, you might view banks as a, representing a kind of middle class, uh, you know, safe space. And you might think of the uh, the borrower as the uh, poor, perhaps, this is stereotyping negatively here, I know, but you might think of the borrower stereotypically as, as the person of a lower social class. Uh, in the Middle Ages, you, you tend to get creditors really, uh, you, know, you know, going after debtors. If you don't pay up, uh, to go out and give them a, a bit of a kicking. Now, working practices, uh, guilds, which is to say communities of workers in the same craft, uh, exist commonly from about 1200 uh, in towns with more than a thousand or so persons. You have to have a pretty big town to have enough people in the same indus industry in order for them to want to band together uh, as a uh, association, a guild. Guilds in very small towns are spotty. Uh, apprenticeship uh, existed in the Middle Ages. Apprenticeships starting at about age 12 and being uh, 7 to 12 years long are very common. Uh, guilds like the London Goldsmiths Company, but later 1300s, have quality enforcement rights. Uh, the Goldsmiths Company, because it's in London, gets quality enforcement rights across all of England, although in reality they couldn't enforce that. If you have a guild in a small town, it would probably have quality enforcement rights in that town. That's to say, if you have a shoemaker's guild in a small town, as you do in Rithen, North Wales, uh, they had the right to check the quality of any shoes put on sale in the marketplace and fine anyone offering inferior goods. In smaller towns, uh, in almost all towns indeed, uh, work tends to be home-based. Your workshop is your home. After 1400, there's a shift and uh, work moves slowly to a workshop in the center of bigger towns and cities. Uh, and this is perceived to be, uh, certainly by Martha Howell in her book, Women, Work, and Patriarchy in the Middle Ages. Again, that's Martha Howell's Women, Work, and Patriarchy in the Middle Ages. This shift of doing the uh, 
productive processes of work in a workshop uh, as opposed to in the home is perceived as an important shift where women are first excluded from the workplace and left behind as it were with the children. Piecework is very common, uh, spinning, weaving, especially piecework refers to the process of, for example, uh, a weaver might buy up a lot of wool and then he might give small parcels of wool to individual women who in their home would spin it into thread. He would then take the thread back from them, give them a small fee and use that thread to weave. That kind of piecework basis is, of uh, labor is quite common in the Middle Ages. Now I'm going to wrap up here by saying just a little bit about uh, colonization and urbanization uh, and then I'll offer you some conclusions. The spread of town life uh, in Wales and Ireland is a crucial aspect of the colonization of those lands by English peoples and it overwhelmingly takes place before 1300. Uh, it's this trebling of population between 1066 and 1300 <coughs> That means that an increasing number of people back in England, where the population rises from 2 million to 6 million, can't afford enough land to feed themselves and their family. And so they often pick up and move uh, to Wales and Wales or Ireland, where an incoming English conquerors in those areas are clearing land and establishing new towns on the basis of, if you just turn up, we will give you a piece of property in this new foundation uh, and you can get low fixed rents and market privileges. So a lot of people in England take up that call and, and uh, really uh, by 1300 a hundred towns have been found in Wales and over 150 in Ireland uh, where they had been uh, none in Wales and only a handful in Ireland uh, just uh, just a century or so before. Again we'll, we'll talk more about this in the migration mobility lecture uh, down the road. So conclusions here in a final slide. So I offer you a snapshot of town life. A town life is prolific and vibrant, but rarely equated to city life. Uh, in fact, towns in the Middle Ages would look more like what we'd call villages now, with uh, maybe just a couple of market stalls uh, and a weekly market, uh, you know, in the centre of the village. A town and country were incredibly closely linked, and at times very hard to distinguish you get villages who aspire to be towns <coughs> with some property held by quote unquote burgage tenure when there is no charter. Uh, sometimes you also get lords who want to create a town and so they extend a charter of urban privileges to a, a rural village but you find a hundred years later it's still just a bunch of farmers in a village. By 1300 as much as 20% <coughs> of the population of England, Wales and Scotland lived in towns. Now that's an increase over the proportion of people who lived in towns in England in 1100, but particularly in Wales and Ireland, it's a dramatic uh, shift because in say 1150, the, pop the urban population of Wales and Ireland would have been down around uh, two or three uh, percent, if not less in Wales. So that, that's a radical shift, particularly there. Scotland, somewhere in the middle. There is some increase in town life, but uh, some towns had, like Edinburgh, had already been there uh, in the 1100s. Notions of the urban by English standards uh, as civilization are projected by Anglo-Norman rulers and used as a justification for notions of superiority in Wales and Ireland. <coughs> The English think of themselves as, as civilizing when they create towns in Wales and Ireland, but these towns in reality are so small that they would have been laughable by the standards of, uh, standards of continental contemporaries uh, in Italy uh, or in uh, the Low Countries of Westphalia. Okay, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>